Hello, everybody. Oh. Happy Friday. Happy rainy Friday. Well, it's rainy for us. It's very rainy. It's kind of the first spring rain of this year, which is kind of nice. It solidifies that winter is done. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say that. Uh, we've, had, <laughs> we've had it seem like it's nice, and then in April, it's like an ice storm. So Yeah. yeah. You're clapping. That's your, your sound cue. Well, I don't know where my little blocks are. I don't know. There's... For whatever reason, Instagram does not record very well. Welcome to Flat Files. Today is episode 46. Today we are talking with Eric Woods from Firecracker Press. Yeah, and I need to apologize because I didn't put the S on his last name three times. I just put Wood, which was an oversight. So I'm, I'm sorry, Eric, for that. Yeah, episode 46. I can't believe it. It's been, been a little trek. Mm-hmm. It's exciting. Yeah. We're nailing it. Well, studio visits. I'm excited to be in a print shop. I've been wanting to go to Firecracker Press for years, and I know this is technically not going there, but it's not not going there. We just know? go there virtually. Yeah. We live on virtual worlds now. Exactly. Who needs who needs human contact? Mm, I don't not know. me, not this guy. Chrissy's just a cardboard. <laughs> well, I'm a real person. You are a real yeah. person. I miss people dearly. <laughs> <laughs> Although with the puppy, we've seen more. We've been seeing my mom and grandma, which has been nice. Yeah. Well, my sister in real life. Did we send an invite to I did. Her? I think I did anyway. Let's see. Let's try again. Send. Hopefully it worked. Hopefully. Oh. Maybe. We'll find out. I like the yellow wall. I like it too. It's nice. It's a nice little feature. Oh no. Is it working? Uh, try again. Um. We're gonna get this. I believe in us. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe? Oh. Unable to join. Oh no. No, oh, no. What internet are we on? The bells. We have multiple internet connections here because uh, rural, rural internet. internet is garbage. It's a bit of a crapshoot. So sometimes it decides to work and sometimes it doesn't. We did it! <laughs> Whoa, look at your rad background. Hi guys, how are you? I'm good, good. how, how are, are you? you? I'm doing well. It's good to see you. It's been a long time. I know, it has been a long time. I apologize for not putting the S on your name. What an oversight. What a <laughs> dumb oversight. Uh, you know, it happens all the time, and I know several other individuals that don't have an S on the end of their name, yeah. and they say people add an S to their name all the time, too. So, you know, it's just one of those things. I get my name spelled or said wrong all the time, and so I know how annoying it is. So when you wrote me that, I was like, no, because I'm like, <laughs> I get my name spelled with a K or Christy or Krista oh, sure. or, yeah. So it's, it's annoying. So I'm, even though it happens all the time, I still feel bad that it happened this time. Oh, don't worry about it. I was in Australia two summers ago for a workshop. And I called the individual that was holding the workshop asking about the attendance. And we had a few people sign up, but it wasn't like a hundred people, you know? And he's like, Eric, nobody knows who you are. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's uh, absolutely no problem. I, I feel like that was something that always stressed me out when we would do workshops here. If like a resident was like, oh, we'd really love to run a workshop while I'm there. And I feel like, okay, we can do that. But I just don't, I can't guarantee attendance. Sometimes like lots of people show up and sometimes no, no one, one shows, shows up. up. And I like always got so nervous about like letting yeah. someone down by not having like a good volume of people, which is sort of something I am loving about this like virtual, like hang out with people online. Cause like, you know, people show up, they pop in, they pop out. You can sort of do like an opt in, opt out very easily. And well, then the reality is, is like it never, the time doesn't always work for people. Yeah. So, so like you might not be free on a noon on a Friday afternoon to watch this. 
but Instagram Live, it'll get recorded. And then it goes up and mm-hmm. people can watch it later. And we get like lovely messages through the week being like, oh, that conversation was really nice or I didn't know about that work. So yeah, this has been a, a very comforting alternative for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's really cool. So I'll give a little bit of the background of what this is in case there's folks on here that haven't heard about it before. And then we will pass it over to you to introduce yourself and then um, we'll go on like a little bit of a tour. Uh, in April of last year, we were talking with Josh Dannon of Direct Tangle Press, who I believe you know, um, or maybe have been acquainted with in some way or another. And uh, we were sort of talking about how we were going to miss the like informal chats that we would have with artists here at the residency. So we were pitching some ideas and kind of convinced him to come live online with us and go through our flat files to show some work that we had, you know, put in drawers and they sort of sit there and don't see the light of day a lot of the time. And we shared his shop and we talked about artwork and just, you know, kind of shot the shit for an hour online. And it was really lovely. And we've just kept going with it and we've been inviting people to hang out with us for you know approximately an hour every friday afternoon to talk about work to talk about their studio practice and and share some projects by other people so we have two art works that we're going to show near the end but we're going to start with having you introduce yourself and your shop and we'll do like a little studio tour and see where it takes us. And then at the end, we'll sort of chat about some other people's projects. Cool. Sweet. Uh, How interactive is this? Can people chime in with questions or is this just kind of me? No, people can definitely chime in with questions. If people do have questions, please just type them into the chat and then we will do our best to read them out and try to address them as we go. We'll put the question reading on Kyle's shoulders because I tend to like get fumbly and nervous trying to read people's names and make sure that I say things properly. So, <laughs> all right, Kyle, you're on, dude. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no pressure, none whatsoever. <laughs> well, uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Eric Woods from the Firecracker Press here in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, smack dab in the central, uh, the center of the United States. And uh, the letterpress, uh, or the Firecracker Press is a letterpress uh, printing studio. Um, we do a lot of design work on the front end. Um, and I would say about 99% of what we end up designing gets printed here as well. And uh, we also take a little bit of client work here uh, now and again. In fact, we've got something on press right now um, that was designed elsewhere and we'll be printing later today. But uh, most of the work we do here is designed here by us and then printed either for us or for client work as well. Um, A little bit about my background. Uh, I went to art school uh, in a former lifetime and uh, got my degree in graphic design, got out into the graphic design world and realized it wasn't really my cup of tea. Um, There are certainly things that I like about graphic design, uh, letter forms, colors, you know, all the basics, the fundamentals. Uh, but I wasn't really fond of the business structure. I wasn't really fond of sitting behind a desk all the time. You know, as design becomes something that is a digital uh, intensive kind of practice, um, I certainly don't have any problem with digital, but it wasn't necessarily something I wanted to do every day. And so mm-hmm. I missed getting my hands dirty. I missed the activity of actually physical working on something and started thinking about other ways to sort of take what I'd learned uh, through school and apply it to something that could become um, a job. Uh, So in 2002, uh, I came home uh, and I said, hey, I think I'm going to start a letterpress shop. My wife and I had just been married and uh, she was like, sure, honey, that sounds like a great idea. (laughs) Um, She was very supportive and um, she sort of just turned me loose. She wanted me to kind of moonlight um, keep my job, do a little moonlighting and see if we can make it work after hours. And I said, you know what? I think we're going to make this go. If it's going to be successful. We've got to give it everything we've got and, yes. uh, really, uh, just pour everything into it. And so after that conversation, I quit my job and, uh, started looking for a press. It's not really the best way to start, not the most responsible way to start a business, but, um, <laughs> I felt really compelled to do so. And so we found a press about two hours from here 
moved it to St. Louis into our first. What was studio. your first press that you got? Uh, I'll show it to you in the, in the studio. Yeah. Um, it's a CNP 10 by 15 Chandler price, 10 by 15. Nice. Um, anyways, 2000 pounds. It was a big beast to move for our first press. Certainly not knowing, uh, what we were doing. Um, but smart enough to be dangerous, I guess. Uh, <laughs> curious enough to be dangerous, maybe. Um, yeah. But we really just started that way. Uh, I started talking to people. I printed some business cards for myself on that press. I started going to parties back when we went to parties and started handing those things out and started drumming up business the old-fashioned way. Um, I really wanted a business loan. I'll give you a little bit of the business background. I really wanted somebody to loan me a bunch of money and give me some sort of comfort level that I could just kind of go and do what I wanted to do. And mm -hmm. that was really just kind of a, a, a pipe dream that, that really, we weren't going to find investors. Um, and I talked to a gentleman uh, through the small business administration here in St. Louis, a retired executive. They gave me a lot of really good advice. He's like, he asked me how much money I needed. And I, I gave him some figure, which was by today's standards, probably pretty low. And he said, hey, buddy, you, know, you, you don't need somebody to give you money. You need to go out and make money. Right. And um, that was really good advice. Uh, I just needed to do the work and hit the pavement, do some things that made me uncomfortable uh, or took, sort of took me out of my comfort zone and talking to people, shaking hands, uh, drumming up business, that kind of thing. And uh, one thing led to another and we started to really see things start to take off. Um, I, again, I'll say before we get into the studio bit, it didn't take off as fast as I hoped, you know, when you're a little yeah. younger and uh, you're starting something with a lot of passion and a lot of energy. I think I thought, you know, within a year I would be um, art famous, you know, <laughs> we yeah. would just be rocking and rolling and I'd have so much work that I couldn't know what to do with it. And it's that reality hit really hard. I mean, that certainly wasn't the case. But what I found is that we got what we needed. Um, you know, we got enough to get by. We got enough to buy another press. We got enough to expand the studio. And bit by bit, we hired people. Uh, we bought a building. Uh, we bought more presses. We hired more people. We started a second location. We started a nonprofit. Uh, COVID hit. And, you know, today, here I am sitting alone in my studio with you guys. Um, yeah. Do you still uh, have people cool. working in the shop during this time or no. how's that? No, no, currently Us it's either. just me. Uh, actually, it, you know, it's been an odd turn of events. Um, right before COVID kind of uh, hit, we were starting to kind of transition into something that was a little bit more of a private practice for me. Um, and, you know, I've got plans for the future in that regard uh, that don't involve COVID. Um, but we found really quickly, I've got two kids. We found really quickly that with the online learning platform, um, my wife or myself would have to stay home basically mm -hmm. to ensure that would happen. And what we've been able to do is to bring them into the shop, find a classroom space for them, um, get them online. And they've been doing, they did their online learning here for a year. Uh, they just recently went back in person here in St. Louis. So, Oh, Okay. So that's been really fortunate. We've turned what was our retail space into a Zoom studio, you know, into a conference <laughs> meeting kind of space. Yeah. Right. And, uh, we've turned our meeting room or, you know, where we used to sort of hold uh, daily meetings into classroom space for the kids. Uh, we've transitioned some of the old desks and computers into workstations for them to do their schoolwork. Oh, and that's been, so nice. Yeah. I've been able to do my own work here uh, as well as client work. Um, really since the beginning. And we've been very fortunate in that regard. I think we've, we've been working the whole time and um, things just kind of keep rolling along. So it's nice that you have a space to be doing the schoolwork with the kids. My sister has three kids and a, like a small ish house for three kids. It's a fair size house, but it's amazing how much space they seem to occupy with volume and trying to make sure that they all have spaces where they can be like, learning and part of their class and maybe not in their bedrooms um, without interrupting each other, or feeling disruptive in the space. It was yeah. a real challenge. Uh, I found that it's really good to get them out of the house and away from the environment, which is a casual environment for them, a comfortable mm -hmm. environment. Yeah. 
and to put them in a space where they're ready to learn. Um, they've both done, I should brag on my kids for a minute, they've both done really, really well with the online learning platform. A little struggle in the beginning to get used to things, but yeah. before they went back in person, they were both kind of like, eh, I don't know. So um, that has been a, a, a fairly good experience in a lot of ways and an eye-opening experience about what public education in America, especially, uh, is all about these days. The online learning platform has given me um, sort of a fly in the wall uh, perspective into their daily life at school, yeah. which I never would have had before. Uh, it's tempting to put your claws into that and uh, try to, you know, uh, micromanage those kind of things. But it's been interesting to hear uh, their teachers, uh, which have been just doing a fantastic job, um, learn and transition along with the students. It's been really cool. Yeah. Oh, that's super good. Yeah. But, uh, and it's nice. That, yeah. I think taking them out of the house, that's really smart. That is a very, if you can do that, it's, it yeah. seems like such a good advantage to have. It was, it wasn't something that we did by design necessarily, but it's something that we found out through the experience. And, um, I, I, I do feel fortunate that we've got this space. It's really a bubble in every sense of the word. Um, that has kept them safe and has kept our interaction very limited uh, and made it possible for my wife and me both to continue uh, working, which is very, yeah. very fortunate. Sweet. So, um, so yeah, I'm here by myself here in the shop, uh, continuing projects. Things have changed. I would say our volume has lowered quite a bit, yeah. uh, but the density is still the same here. Um, we're no less busy than we were a year ago. It's just that we're not able to crank out as much work. I mean, there's only so much you can physically do. Um, so it's made me be a little bit smarter about the work that we take on. And um, I think a little bit more disciplined about um, how we go about that, how we design yeah. stuff, frankly. Yeah. So. That makes sense. I feel like we can relate to that too, yep. for sure. Yeah. You know, slowing down, I, I, would, I would tell anybody, as far as my perspective is, uh, slowing down has not necessarily been uh, a bad thing. It's been certainly unexpected. Uh, it wasn't in our five-year or our 10-year plan here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I'm finding that that's given us some perspective on projects that we really had in the cooker back in February last year that now looking back on them almost seem uh, naive in a way. And... Um, I think with that perspective, hopefully we can continue those projects, you know, take the seeds of those ideas uh, and maybe uh, mature them a little bit and uh, see how they come about post COVID. Nice. So, yeah. That sounds smart. That yeah. sounds great. Let's do a tour. I'm excited. Yeah, let's look around. So I'm sitting in the front of uh, what used to be our retail space, but is now our Zoom space, which is why I've got this, uh, I love this background. Yeah. News style. Um, I'm, I'm at the Oscars, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> at the and, um, I'm on the red carpet today. So uh, well, it's you know, like your craft booth at the SGCs was always like this, just sea of beauty for the eyes that like stood <laughs> up above everything else. I was like mega jealous of that. Um, it was like simple, like cardboard foldy thing. I think that just was plastered with, posters and prints and it was hilarious yeah we yeah well that uh, yeah pre-covid i mean we had all kinds of little gadgets and foldable uh transformable um displays for different size events and uh sgc was always one of our bigger sort of displays that we had to carry around but i recently just went through a lot of those and started sort of cannibalize them for other projects and dismantle some of that stuff um just because that isn't much of a reality right now. And I know oh, yeah. it's really not <laughs> much of a reality for us in the next, uh, at least the foreseeable future. So, yeah. so let me grab the camera and I'm just going to walk around with it. Um, Sounds see if perfect. I switch the view. Here. So it's a little dark. There's a little transition. So I'm going to step back. This is the darkness of our space. Now that we've kind of turned off all the lights, this was the old retail space. Oh, cool. You know, I'm going to walk you guys back through this. Oh, I love this little door. This is the door that sort of separates our um, 
There we go. Our <laughs> workshop so space funny. from the retail space. We used to have people walking directly up to, excuse me, up to the presses, and um, we found that we needed to separate those two. So, yeah. sort of uh, our type collection, at least as it lives now, at least portions of it. I don't know how much of that you can see. The the downstairs here is sort of uh, our basement, sort of dark space, but. Oh, nice. I love type cabinets. They're just so lovely to look at. Yeah, it's good furniture. So working space, you can see we've got some new acquisitions here and uh, baggies. Um, nice. Type stuff that we've grabbed recently. Oh, cool. That's um, fun. Sort of sorting through some of that stuff. Yeah, I've got oh. my kids here sitting at this table doing woodcuts and then sorting through type. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so back to the shop here. Oh, man. How big is the shop? Uh, square footage-wise, it's about 2,500 square feet. Nice. And then we have a basement um, where we do a lot of storage of wood blocks as those things sort of grow and take over. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have many. I wish we had more, like... We don't have a lot of type and we have, I mean, we have some carved wood, but we haven't been like, we just haven't been using our shop in the same way that we used to right now. Cause we've been getting kind of different types of projects. Oh, it's so full and so fun looking. I love it. Well, you know, our, we're not using the space the same way, way we used to either. And in there are certain corners that I won't show you that have sort of become uh, borderline bachelor pad kind of messy, you know, like, um, dust collecting in corners and cobwebs that didn't ever used to be there. But, uh, you know, like I said, we are just as busy as we were before, but the volume has changed considerably. So, um, so have you been mostly doing like, um, like your own projects or when you say you've been just as busy, cause you do have like a lot of just like personal work that's up on your site and on your Instagram page, but are you still getting um, commercial work, but because you're by yourself, it just means that you have to limit how much. Yeah. Um, yes, we are getting commercial work. In fact, I would say about 90% of what we're doing right now is client based stuff. Uh, design and print stuff, uh, just like before, um, we're doing a lot less uh, retail design and, uh, you know, concepting and uh, production uh, through our website or through our retail shop. However, our, our website has been pretty busy since day one mm -hmm. uh, as people have transitioned from visiting and uh, into sort of buying online. But... Um, Yes, 90% of it uh, since last March has been client work. Uh, we've been really fortunate to do less. We have less clients, but with bigger projects, I guess. Uh, oh, okay, so yeah. Things that will, will have been sort of developing or might need three or four months to develop, um, which kind of goes to my point of lower volume, uh, but still the same kind of intensity. Like I'm still coming in every day and I've got deadlines and things to do, uh, but it's m for much larger scale projects that, um, you know, we're not uh, necessarily showing progress on every day from an Instagram standpoint, you know? Yeah. Um, I know exactly uh, what you mean. Yeah. Things that are working and sort of bubbling up um along the way so i can show a couple of those pieces too today yeah that would be great uh, roxy press stuff. asked uh what kind of projects you're working on which is exactly kind of this topic but yeah an example would be awesome uh i will i can show you exactly what we're working on uh right now which is a, a work for hire kind of project it's something that another designer sent us um uh, which like i said from the top we do a little bit of um there is a county in the state of Missouri that is celebrating 200 years and having a big celebration this summer. I'm not sure how they're pulling all this off, uh, <laughs> but they've got a lot of stuff planned and uh, we're doing posters and postcards for them. So let's see, I'll turn this. So this is sort of the first color on one of the posters. Uh, okay. Again, some, something that someone else put together as far as design goes. 
Um, and when that, when it comes to that, most of the time we're doing photopolymer in that regard. Um, I can show you a little bit of what a, a photopolymer plate would look like. So that's part of the poster, and then this is part of the postcard. This is oh, okay. the postcard, actually. That's our photopolymer plate on press. Are you making those in-house? Yes, we do the photopolymer in-house. Nice. Uh, <laughs> so the print, I'll put the print next to the... You know, there's our print and the the, the photopolymer. You can really, I don't yeah. know how much yeah. detail you can see there, but oh uh, yeah, the yeah, that gives you a lot of opportunity for really deep detail, which is pretty cool. Do like because you carve a lot of blocks. Do you? Um, we do. Like, if you're working, if someone commissions you for a project, is your preference to? like carve it or do you sort of look at what the project is asking and then just determine what's going to be the best um, material for that and, and it doesn't really matter to you or would you would you try to make everything like a woodcut if possible? Uh, most of the work that we're doing uh, design wise gets woodcut at least a portion of it gets woodcut um, and that would go for a poster, that would go for a wedding invitation, that would go for a business card, um, you know, just about anything from a commercial sense that we're designing for somebody and printing, we would probably do some sort of a woodcut element. Uh, we do a lot of combining of woodcuts and wood type, woodcuts and photopolymer, um, woodcuts, wood type and photopolymer, you know, just kind of depending on the project. Uh, we like to do everything as old school as possible and generally only use photopolymer if an impression is called for. Right. Or uh, a designer has given us something that can't be replicated one-to-one -one through the woodcut process. Not a lot of designers are cool enough to um, understand the coolness of hand-carved. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of people like that effect. Mm -hmm. um, but if you've sat for two weeks designing something on the computer uh, and you want to see it exactly like you see it on the screen, there's just no way for us to replicate that in wood. And so um, in 20 years, we've not really found a good partnership in that regard where somebody is like, you know, here's my initial idea. You guys go and carve it out and let's see what happens. Like nobody's willing to take that chance. Um, <sighs> I so the woodcuts stay with us, you know, like when we're designing stuff for clients, they're coming to us because we're doing that kind of work. And uh, <laughs> that's kind of what we are uh, keen in doing. So that works uh, pretty well. Roxy Press asks, how do you print your woodcuts? Uh, we're doing our woodcuts on the same presses that we're doing the photopolymer on. Um, so this press is a Vandercook SP20. Well, oh, it's such a nice size. Yeah, this will do like an 18 by 24 inch poster size. So um, lovely. Uh, so are you, are you buying like half inch plywood or are you carving on like end grain cherry wood? Do you got to shim up that plywood in the chassis so it meets type height? Yeah. Um, so we're using three quarter inch ply. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That is so Oh my great. God, that's amazing. This is, well, I, Do you I'm, not gonna take, I'm not going to take you downstairs because you'll see the bachelor pad um, <laughs> chic down there. That's but uh, yeah, this is just some of our cuts. Um, three quarter inch ply. And then let me see if I can find it. I'll show you under the press here. So we use what we call the patented firecracker <laughs> base. <laughs> I love it. And if you can see this, that's chipboard yeah now don't anybody go out there and try to use these without my permission because we worked for a long time to develop this in r d and you can see that it's trademarked so uh, yeah. that's what we that's what we use <laughs> under that's what we use under the ply for uh to build this type high that's great and when Kyle's, and we're, we're when they're well. saying type high if people don't know what that means the the rollers on the vandercook 
are they ink they self ink and then you roll it across and it's all attached to one system so if your woodcut isn't at the right height when you pass the roller over top of your print the the ink won't actually hit the surface of your block so you have to bring it up to a certain height and the height is the height of old type so old lead type old wood type so you have to get it to that height in order for it to actually get an impression Right, so this is a type high gauge. Let me see if I can do this with camera in my hand. That distance right there is 0.918 inches, and three quarter inch is 0.75. So when you add three quarter inch to our patented bases, then that brings it up to 918. Beautiful. You need to get somebody to develop a like a pressed paper that's that exact height, and then um, you know start selling that on your website. I buy one. Well, the great, the great <laughs> thing about the system is that it's easily uh, customizable. I mean, every woodcut we do is going to be a different size. Mm -hmm. And so, like with a boxcar base, for example, on photopolymer, you've got, we've got like a 9 by 12. I mean, it's not, it's aluminum. It's not going to change. It's going to be a 9 by 12 always. So we have to adapt our plates here. I can show you. We have to adapt our plates to fit on that, that base. But with the uh, chipboard, we can cut our bases, which we've got many, many, many under the press here in various yeah. right. sizes. We can cut our bases to fit our wood cut, and then we can lock up uh, wood and metal type around that. We could lock up a photopolymer plate next to that uh, and run everything on the press in one pass. Yeah, so that metal um, rectangle that's underneath the polymer plate is the boxcar base. So it's just like we, we bought one without thinking about how much shipping and then importing into Canada was going to cost. It was an incredibly expensive piece yeah, of metal. It's like a $500 <laughs> Canadian piece of aluminum. <laughs> Plus $500 for import shipping oh, costs. God, is that yeah. It was so much money. We bought one. I will never buy another one again. <laughs> Drive to upstate New York. <laughs> yeah, no, we really time. should have. <laughs> and so, yeah, so that brings that up to the right height. And it's nice because it has, like, the grid on it, which is, like, really lovely if you're sort of setting up a more complicated arrangement of different little pieces. For sure. Yeah, you can see the grid under the plate there. Mm -hmm. We've got everything lined up. I mean, you can see how that's nice and straight. It's yeah. pretty seamless. I mean, a lot of people don't like photopolymer because they think it's cheating as far as letterpress is concerned. And, um, you know, it certainly makes life easier in some ways. Um, but I've got no, uh, no issues with any format or any kind of uh, substrate. Uh, we've printed buttons. We've printed carpet. We've printed... Um, the bottoms of shoes on these presses, um, you know, anything that has a, anything that has a relief on it. Um, Legos are great. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, anything that's got a relief on it is printable on these presses as long as you can bring them up to type high. So uh, that takes a little bit of fidgeting, but uh, with some ingenuity, most things that have a relief can be built up to the correct height. <laughs> Bauer Box says it's not cheating if it works. That is correct. I 100% agree. Although I've been guidering. doing pop, these pop-up uh, woodcut projects with a friend of mine, Jenna Kush, and we were doing an installation and it was like we were working with high school students and so they were helping us develop the idea. We, we pitched them the concept for the installation and then we like brainstormed how we, what kind of direction we wanted to take it in, what sort of images would work, blah, 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 which meant that like the production time was really cut down. And we had normally been hand carving the wood cuts and then printing them on rice paper and then um, like collaging that onto these pop up, like sort of like a pop up book, but an installation of different pop ups. But it just was not feasible to do it in the time. And we also kind of felt like, even though we know the work th that goes into making a polymer plate, or we ended up going with screen print, is just as much work. You're still drawing the whole image and getting the plates right. ready and pulling all of the prints by hand. It w there was this little part of us that felt like we were sacrificing some of the like purity of the process because we weren't carving everything out of wood, which... I don't know. I don't know why that's like a concept that does pop into your head sometimes. 
I think the wood's just so nice. Sure. Uh, the wood gives you a lot of uh, benefits, but, um, you know, we do posters. And I can show you a couple where um, they've got to have sponsor logos on the bottom, you know, and they've got to be the size of a postage stamp. And, they, you know, you just, there's just, unless you're doing magnesium, which is probably not really good for the environment and more and more difficult to find, um, photopolymer seems to be a really good sort of middle ground. Uh, for environment, environmental impact and flexibility, um, mm-hmm. yeah, especially if you can do your own plates in house. So we we figured that out a long, long time ago. After sending out for about a year, um, you know, it was a four day, four or five day turnaround for us. Um, yeah. So to have, the, well, I'll show you guys that little machine. There's not much of it to look at, but to have a little photopolymer plate maker in house. It's so cute. Uh, cut that four days, like 45 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. We bought this used, uh, went to Chicago and picked it up. Uh, it needed some repair, but uh, we got it working and uh, we've been using it for the last 15, 15, 17 years or so. Yeah. Does, does your polymer plate maker uh, have like a hose hookup and wash it out for you? Um, it's not hooked. It's not like uh, hard lined into the plumbing. Um, so I've got a little bucket. And, you know, once we clean it out, we just drain it and then uh, put fresh water in. And we, ah, cool. When we were really running a gun and we were doing that almost nightly, but, um, you know, now it might be every couple weeks. <laughs> yeah. So you have how many Vandercooks in the shop? I, I think I saw two for sure. We've got, yes, we've got two here. Um, and then, like I said earlier, we've got a nonprofit organization, which used to be our second location here in St. Louis. Yeah. And in that space, we currently have three more. Um, one of them just recently sold. So we're actually going to deliver that next week. Um, I never thought I'd get rid of a Vandercook ever in my life, but I feel yeah. like we've got more than we need. And uh, it was time to kind of let one go. Uh, it's going into an education system, so we're really happy about that. It'll give a lot of use, and uh, it's going to a really good home. So, um, yeah, Vandercook's what we use, you know. Um, a little bit on the platen side, too, platen presses. But really, uh, most of the work we're doing is Vandercook. I know a lot of people that are doing Heidelberg work, uh, Heidelberg windmill work, and just swear up and down by those presses. But I've never been able to get my... Uh, bearings with those or uh, feel the need to go through all of them or rig- rigmarole to get them set up. I'm used to the Vandercooks and um, at least for now, I guess I'm young enough to turn the crank all day. So <laughs> I keep doing that while I can. I've never used a Heidelberg. I think that I would be the kind of person that would end up getting seriously injured. I, I just don't pay enough attention when I'm working that I would, yeah, I would be one of the people that would is like a cautionary tale as to the damage yeah. that can be done by them. Um, Roxy well, Press between, asks, Oh, sorry. You go for it, and then we're going to cycle oh, back to the question. Between, between Firecracker and our nonprofit, Central Print, we've got three Heidelberg windmills, but uh, we use them for workshops mostly uh, when people right. come to town and teach. Well, that leads us to our question from Roxy Press. What, what does your not-for-profit do? Uh, well, it's a long story, but in... Uh, about 2009, 2010, we started offering classes here at the shop uh, after hours. Um, it was a way that we could uh, introduce what we're doing to a wider audience, do a little education, and then it gave the staff here an opportunity to uh, earn a little extra dough. Um, so those became really, really popular. And... Um, so much so that once people were done, they were like, now what do I do? You know, like I've taken this for five weeks. I'm really interested. Um, can I use your presses after hours? And we were already running everything during the day and then doing classes after night. There was no place for people to go unless they wanted to buy their own equipment. And so we started thinking about trying to figure out a way to um, create a space that had de- designated um, classroom space and presses. Mm -hmm. Uh, At the same time, Firecracker was expanding. We needed a little bit more room. And so we started looking for a second location and we found a place that was way too big just for us, just for Firecracker. Um, But it it was a perfect fit to start a second location for us and also peel off 
a nonprofit into that space and start this dedicated equipment rental. Um, and so that's really what Central Print does, uh, teaches classes and workshops for kids to adults to corporate groups, um, has open studio hours. So once you know a little bit about how to run presses, you can yeah. come and use them. Mm -hmm. um, we do talks, you know, or we did talks. Uh, we've got, we had a venue space that was for rent and then we have a real, um, uh, interest in preserving local print culture. So we're buying out old newspapers, we're buying out old presses that, um, are either, uh, folks are aging out or have been abandoned or towns don't know what to do with and, uh, starting a collection in that regard, um. Now the nonprofit has sort of taken over that space, uh, the second location. Right. So Firecracker more or less has moved its footprint out of that location and is back in the location where I am now. So it's sort of complicated, but that's kind of what we're doing uh, between Firecracker and Central Print. That's that's a really good strategy to divide um, like that commercial business printing from that community building. Like this is something that Chrissy and I have ran into, where like sometimes we have jobs that we just have to print, but we also have residents that also want to print, and then sure. we have people in the community that want to come in and print. And so sometimes managing the press time gets really difficult. Like our shop's not crazy big; it's like nine hundred square feet, and there's like six presses in it. And so, like, you know, comfortably, two people can, like, walk around and navigate each other. But, like, once you start asking, like, hey, can I come in on Friday as well? And can I? And can I? And you're like, oh, no, I, I need to use the press. <laughs> I actually have a paying job this weekend. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah. Like, having a not-for-profit is a smart idea. Uh, you know, it has opened a lot of doors for us. Um, we team up with the Ladies of Letterpress every year for the Ladies of Letterpress conference. Yeah, that was great and, online. Yeah. Was uh, following along. We're, we're starting our sixth year, I think, with that. Um, we meet year round to plan that out. That's a, a big process. But pre pandemic, we were using uh, Central Print as the headquarters for the, um, for the conference. Now we're doing a lot of virtual stuff. And so Central Print is still the headquarters, so to speak. But uh, we're able to welcome audiences from around the world to. Uh, join in on that and um, you know like we were able to do a little bit of corporate stuff as far as workshops here in the shop but uh, like Kyle was saying it just gets a little crowded if you get 25 mm -hmm. people in here it gets pretty crowded and so the other space uh, the other space is 8,000 square feet it's a lot of room oh, and yeah. we've had 75 to 100 people in there learning um, various aspects of wood carving and printing and ink mixing and all kinds of things. So uh, that's lovely. That's such a nice amount of space. I wish we had that kind of space. I feel like we had um, like a group of uh, college students that would come once a year here for a period of time. Uh, the program isn't in operation anymore at the college, but and there was about 35 students and they would come and do an etching workshop. And we basically like had it set up so that it was just this like rotating system. So you were like on this one lineup where you're inking all your yeah. plates and then you would right. you know, move down the line and stand in another line to get onto the press. And then you would move around the press to like hanging all your prints up to dry. And then you would go back in the circle to start inking back up again. And if people didn't, follow the like one way path like we have in the grocery stores now because of COVID, <laughs> then it, the whole system would just start to break down because there was yeah. just like physically not enough space for all the people to be in it. Yeah. It's yeah. a print factory, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. I roll inside had said uh, that they have been to central print and it's really great and had no idea that's how it started. Yeah, that's sort of our origin story. So I'm the board chair there, at least for now. Um, I can't be the board chair forever. And so, uh, you know, we're in a growing stage of central print for sure. Um, we're going into our sixth year. Uh, certainly never thought we would go through what we've been through as far as the pandemic is oh, concerned yeah. with uh, a nonprofit organization, which brings in most of its revenue through workshops in person and the venue space, uh, you know, for events. And so it's been pretty wild, but, 
we found uh, ways to make it work last year uh, through some really dedicated folks and through some serendipity. And um, so that's you great. Know, uh, see where the future holds, but um, yeah. yeah. Can we see um, a woodcut project that like, um, it doesn't have to be a commercial project. I'm, I'm, I really love all the food prints. So I don't know if that's like possible to look at. If it's not, that's cool. Whatever is available and easy to access. But just we've seen the polymer plate and we've seen the, you know, the base, the copyrighted sure. base. But maybe we could see <laughs> some woodcuts uh, for reference about what that kind of looks like. I know that you just yeah. posted some uh, piece that looked really beautiful and kind of complicated on online recently, too. I don't know how new it is because I don't. I don't know if you're like us and sometimes things go up way later after they've actually been finished. Uh, I've got actually a couple different uh, poster series here that are all, that are all involve woodcuts. Um, and I can kind of show you the posters. And then if you want to see the actual physical woodcut too, I can try to pull that out. Yeah. Um, let me start with the posters first though. Um, I'm going to switch things around here. So let's see if I can pull back a little bit more. Can you guys see that okay? There's three yeah. posters there. So uh, Lost and Found is a fundraiser for a local nonprofit. And we have done four or five different posters for them uh, over the years. Uh, the organization is called Perennial. And their, uh, I guess their mission in a way is to uh, reuse and recycle as much as possible, train people mm -hmm. on how to do that. Uh, I think they used to have dumpster diving classes, but they've got, you know, they've got wood shop classes to take furniture and repair it and sewing That's classes so cool. to fix your clothes and all kinds of stuff. So it's a really great organization and we do posters for their fundraisers. And so these are all posters that are designed and printed using woodcuts and um, both wood and metal type as well as photopolymer. And we're printing on recycled substrates. So the one you're seeing right now is on recycled grain bags that we um, had donated from a local brewery. Oh, cool. Dismantled the bags. You can see at the top here. It's ragged. Yeah. yeah. There's the fringe. And it's really, I mean, it's just a bag. Um, but we dismantled them and then uh, trimmed them to size and then uh, used as much as we could to. Oh, sweet. That's <laughs> yeah. That's Love awesome. That. So which part of this is type and wood and polymer? So the big words are type, uh, wood type. Um, wood cut is on the light blue and that sort of beigey brown in the background. Mm -hmm. And then photopolymer is down there where the sponsor by logos are. Again, yeah. you know, those are postage uh, stamp size and need to be what they are, uh, what they're designed for. Uh, so it's a real big combination of all those things. I love that. I know it makes sense, um, but some people so might not know. <laughs> yeah. So that's the first year. And then the second year we printed on... Um, Recycled refrigerator boxes. <laughs> not so our this is, No, not at all. This is, uh, you know, this is corrugated uh, cardboard. You can see the... Oh, uh, what's corners. that like printing? To, like, are you doing that to the Vanderbilt? We are. Um, you'll see at the top, they're all three-hole punched. Oh. And we built a registration system in the bed that you could put the three-hole punch into. Um, so it didn't have to go around the drum. That's smart. That's okay. super smart. It, you know, it would never bend. But the cool thing about this project is uh, we designed them so they had to be cut in half in order to read the poster. So we forced everybody at the event to actually cut the poster with scissors, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which was, you know, not everybody's willing to do uh, no. very easily. But uh, I'm showing you the, you know, the stiff version but what we actually ended up delivering to them were these really beat up versions. I don't know if you can see that or not, but yeah. this is like completely <laughs> you know, just trash.
crushed. We took these in the back and beat them with a baseball bat is what we did. Mm, that's amazing. <laughs> that's awesome. And then the last year that we did them, um, we printed them on recycled uh, architectural envelopes. So these giant envelopes that, um, like when architectural plans were actually blueprints, you know, mm-hmm. um, a company brought us a bunch of these in a big stack and we cut them in half. And that's, again, why this is ragged at the top. Cool. And again, just printed on this, you know, really super thin uh, recycled stock. Woodcuts and that. photopolymer. See, that's like, this so nice to see how you can take a material that, you know, essentially is garbage and then with the use of like printmaking tools can turn it into something that's like so beautiful that people are nervous to cut it in half to form it into <laughs> its actual final state. You know, I love that. Yeah. The, you know, the project went to their mission and um, was really close to our hearts as well, as far as reusing and using what you've got. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, really gave us an opportunity to explore some things that we'd been thinking about for a long time, but not really had, the project to do. So for example, like this corrugated cardboard, I've always wanted to print on corrugated because it's such a fantastic material and it's everywhere. Yeah. Uh, But if you put it in a platen press, it crushes pretty easily. And so developing a system where it could be uh, printed on the Vander cook was, uh, felt like a breakthrough for us. Um, So a lot of fun, you know, and sort of atypical, I think of what a lot of people think of as posters and what a lot of people think of as letterpress in particular. Well, and promotion, like a way mm-hmm. to like talk about an event where the material and the function of that material speaks to the like content of the event. Yeah. It's like sure. super smart. I like that a lot. Um, so a little bit more of a quote unquote traditional um, woodcut project. Uh, yeah, maybe this, this is, is the one, one you saw, about. Chrissy. Yeah. yeah, this is one we just finished. And actually, we started this project back in February last year with no idea that COVID was going to hit. And it got shelved because it's a it's a backyard event. Uh, it got shelved. And we weren't sure if it would actually be produced. But um, it's back on. So we were able Great. to do it this year. Bring those woodcuts back out and uh, print them. So this is three colors using three different colors to kind of mix on press and uh, create eh, five, six colors there, I think. I lo- cool. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, I like the color combination of this piece a lot. So, yeah. So it's the pink on the blue and then the orange. Yeah, pink and orange and then that greenish blue kind of color. And when the pink hits the greenish, it turns the purple. Uh, when the pink and the yellow come together, they kind of make an orange. Um, and so that's how you get those kind of mixing together. The yellow and the green kind of make a darker green, I guess, in a way. I love that. So when people, um, when someone asks you to make a poster, a woodcut poster, do they have a lot of, um, do they just give you free creative license to just take it in the direction that you want it to go in? Or do they, is it a lot of back and forth like you would have with like a traditional sort of graphic design process? Yeah. So, um, we, I would say that, you know, like somebody walks in the door and says, Hey, we need a poster. Um, we're doing a, let's say we're doing a backyard event. Um, where you can tour people's backyards. Um, We're all about sustainability and um, some of those things could be gardening. Some of that could be beekeeping. Some of that could be solar. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, we're just going through this like information collection process and this listening process more than anything. Um, After that, we're gathering as much information externally as we can uh, through research Mm-hmm. And our goal in the beginning stage is to solve the problem, you know, like traditional graphic design kind of stuff. Like, here's the problem. Solve it visually. Um, we try really hard to solve it visually um, as best we can the first time out of the gate. I don't like to redo things. And our pricing structure, I mean, 
we could go on and on about pricing for letterpress, which is a whole other aspect of conversation. I've been but... actively trying not to ask you about that because I know. <laughs> well, that I'm, happy probably... to, I'm happy to talk about it, but it's a long conversation. Um, and a lot of people think that letterpress is really expensive. Um, when you boil it down, the, like the hour by hour, it's probably a lot more economical than most people think. Um, and so we try to do things right the first time. We try to listen really hard and do a lot of research. So we're able to hone in on um, what's needed as well as what can be produced by us. And then, um, you know, we're trying to show as much behind the scenes as we can so that it's not a surprise when the client comes back and sees mm -hmm. this thing that we've created. Um, there's a, a bit of show, showmanship or uh, showbiz that goes into the reveal. You know, like you see all these like uh, mechanic uh, things on HGTV and house reveals and all that kind of stuff. And like, there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, it's, <laughs> those shows aren't very based on reality, but there is a lot of truth in like, hey, hey man, I brought in this old car. Can you fix it up for me and make it look great? Yeah, that's a $40,000 job. Okay. And then they come back like two weeks later and then they pull off the curtain and here it is. You know, like we're not too far off from doing that, but you've got to show people a little peek behind the curtain along the way. So it's not mm -hmm. a complete, yeah. like, wait a minute. I said I wanted it red, but that looks orange. Well, no, I'm like, we, you know, we've talked about this, you know, <laughs> like this yeah. is part of the plan. Um, and in that process, I think we've done really good over the last 20 years in making that work where most times people walk in and say, this is amazing. Let's do it. Um, that, ha that doesn't happen all the time. That's certainly not a guarantee. And we're very flexible in the regard that we'll make changes or try to hone in on it if we, if we miss the mark. But um, I would say 90% of the time, 99% of the time, really, we, 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 we hit the mark and people don't people come to us because they want what we do, you know, like yeah. um, if you're calling me to get screen printing done, you're calling the wrong guy, you know, uh, <laughs> if you're calling me to do a brochure, you're calling the wrong guy. And um, we certainly do sort of weed out a lot of those kind of projects, but um, there's almost a smell or a sense that happens when the client calls and you know that this is going to work, you know, just by the way they're talking and the questions they're asking and their curiosity and openness to ideas. And uh, we try really hard to find those people and hold on to those people as much as we can and continue yeah. working with those kind of folks. So like with, the, um, with these projects for perennial, that's totally the way this goes. They say, here's what we need to do. Um, what materials do you need? And I say, do you have any corrugated cardboard? And she says, yep, we work with a furniture company that has all kinds of recycled refrigerator cardboard. Um, hey, what are we going to use this year? Oh, you know, uh, that microbrew down the street has a bunch of leftover grain bags. Would you be able to use those? Absolutely. Um, so that's kind of how that goes. And then, you know, whatever comes out of it is just a really good collaboration between them and us. Um, awesome. this one, you know, took a little more convincing because we wanted chickens. I've got chickens in my backyard and we wanted chickens. And in the beginning, they felt like this was a little bit too chicken focused. Um, <laughs> because if you look in this poster, there are solar panels on the houses, you know, there's a garden back there. There's a worm down at the bottom to talk about, is it vermiculture? I don't know how you, how you say that, but, yep. uh, the flowers are, are native, um, so they're growing corn and pots in the back, you know, like there's all kinds of stuff in this poster. That's not just chicken related, but, um, we have another chicken poster that we produced about five years ago that sold out almost instantly. And so it took a little convincing on my behalf to say like, look, everybody loves chickens and these are going to go really well. If you, if you let us do this and they were like, okay, sure. We trust you. And <laughs> that's kind of what we ended up with. Um, it's true though everybody does love chickens and i think having like a focus that isn't a house and in, is like a like a creature that you can yeah. like attach yourself to is is good for a poster 
Yeah, yeah, you've got to have that central figure, right? And, exactly. You know, which you've got over here with the leaf and, and, and so on and so forth. So you're right in that regard for sure. Yeah. Um, is that block out at all or, or the, is that all packed away? Uh, I think I had these blocks packed away, but uh, if you give me just a second, uh, if you don't it's mind like a shaky, shaky camera for just a second, I'll, I, I know I've got some out over here. Our chat is anticipating our questions. Herma5 just asked, would you please show the wood block for the chicken poster? Oh, uh, you know what? I would love to, but it is stored away. I put it away. Um, I put it away last week. Uh, we finished it up last week and I put it away. But um, these are just, this is a stack of blocks that we got out that we had from actually from Ladies of Letterpress last fall that are still out in the corner. But. Um, <laughs> I can show you a little bit about these guys. This is like one of the first woodcuts we ever made uh, for oh, the shop. Wow. And this is before we invented the patented base. And you can see this is like half inch. Yep. Yeah. It's got three plies, which is, we found out is a no-no. And then uh, we carved on the back as well, which works, but, you know. It's also a no-no. <laughs> <laughs> kind of also a no-no. So this is a twofer. Um, but uh, we printed postcards with this and took them around to parties and handed them out and convinced people that we were sane, um, not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, we used to do a lot of uh, posters for a local uh, music venue called the Billiken Club here in St. Louis. We did almost 90 posters for them. Oh, I love um, and so this is for... Um, this is for Richard Swift. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. Um, no. Amazing artist. He actually just passed away, I think, two years ago. Um, but he came through town, and we were really thrilled about doing a poster for him. Ended up, uh, the venue was so cool because it was tiny and free, and uh, the bands would all come out after they were done, and they would have uh, tacos and drink in the crowd. And we were able to meet him, and it was just a lot of fun. And, um, again, woodcuts. Um, and uh, yeah, one of our one, really kind of some of our first projects here, both this one and uh, this is part of another poster where we're, you know, we don't have this type in house. So uh, we're designing this, this laying it out, and then carving it. Right. That's awesome. I really like this TV. Yeah. Um, oh, that's nice and thick, that one. Yeah. So that's three quarter inch, multiple plies, much better. Um, you can see we've got this one cut out. Yeah. There's a little notch there. I'm I'm thinking that was for economy, so we didn't have to actually carve it. But <laughs> <laughs> I can't Smart, remember. Smart, actually, though. Because <laughs> yeah. carving open space is super annoying. Yes. But this is so lovely. And yeah, the hand I mean, carving it... font. Oh, man. But I am not good at that. So it's beautiful to see it. Thank you. So these projects for Billiken Club, we were getting this information on like a Monday morning, Monday afternoon, and then the show would be Friday night. So oh my god, what? oh my god. <laughs> yeah, yeah. These were always really quick. Um, we would design it on Tuesday. We'd carve it on Wednesday. We'd print it on Thursday. They would come by Thursday afternoon and pick them up. And this is when we were still hanging posters around town. You know. Um, so they go around town, hanging them on Thursday night for a Friday night show. Wow, that That's is a wild turnaround. turnover! Oh my yeah. god! Yeah, so five years over the course of five years, we did ninety posters for them, and um, it was kind of that always, you know, like we go through these seasons where we were doing nothing but Billiken Club stuff. Man, uh, Roxy Press asks, have you ever used a laser cutter or uh, to produce woodcuts, or like, are you like traditional yeah. hand carved? Uh, yeah, no, um, no qualms about using a laser cutter. I don't, we don't have one. Um, but I've got a friend that has one and we've used his, uh, for several projects. In fact, I could show you one of them. Yeah. I want to show you guys this because you guys are Canadian. <laughs> we are. <laughs> I mean, we're not hockey people, but it is well, a Canadian passion. <laughs> yeah. I'm not this necessarily is... a hockey person either, but um, we St. Louis uh, hosted the All-Star Game last year, 
it was actually the last big event I think that St. Louis had in, in January, February. Um, and so we did the posters uh, for it. And mm-hmm. that key color is a laser cut. So oh, this is a three, cool. three color poster, um, two wood cuts for the yellow and the light blue. And then the key color was laser. And the reason we did laser for the key uh, it's all because of this. So this yeah. was provided to us. And you can see there's a TM here. And over here there's a copyright or registered mark. All those things had to stay. Um, NHL's pretty strict about colors and uh, keeping their logo true to form. And so uh, for that element alone, uh, the laser cut worked quite well. And the great thing about laser is, I don't know if you can see the little schmutz here. You know, that dark blue schmutz. Yeah. And then down here, there's a lot of dark blue schmutz. Yep. We were able to go back into that laser cut and carve out some of the stuff in all the voids that um, would catch the rollers and print. Right. Um, so this in particular right here. Oh goodness, my camera work. This right here was not on the original design. So your, to your question earlier, do, do people just let you do what, whatever you want to do? Like we showed them a design that looked really similar to this, but it certainly didn't have that serendipity. And that's a decision we make on press when mm-hmm. it's, you know, being printed. Um, and just between us and the world, I didn't ask for permission to do that. So uh, when it all came down, like that shadow that's created there yeah. uh, with the ice ended up working really well. And it's yeah. something that um, I think is really cool about laser cuts in particular. It's cool about laser cuts because it's also similar, you know, to the stuff you get from carving the with, a, yeah. with a knife, that noise. Yeah. Um, I love so it. I like that quite a bit. I'm going to do one of our shares because it kind of works nicely with the, um, the band poster um, because it's, it's a rainy sort of spring ish day here in Ontario. And whenever it's like kind of rainy and we're in our little farmhouse and it's quiet, I like really, we have an old record player that is very temperamental with humidity. And this was a resident that stayed with us. um, Matt Cully uh, a few times and he's a singer songwriter very folk inspired music um indie artist beautiful like this album eons this was the first one uh arctic radio and it, it is such a gorgeous album i love it so much it was done in 2012 and then he and his partner arden um who's been with us on flat files before came and stayed another few times and they, for the second album, um, along with a few other collaborators, created this Rezo printed um, zine for the album. So it's filled with photographs that Arden took, some of which are at our house. This is one, this is our smoke bush in our backyard and our catalpa tree. And then it's printed in Toronto at color code and they do um, really gorgeous Rezo printing. They're, they're great Rezo printers. Um, And I think that that like partnership between musicians and the print world has been such a like long lasting love affair and I like that, you know, the, the collaboration can change and shift. So instead of doing like a traditional, you know, album like this, you got this book that had a link to the digital download in it. And so all of the work is in there and all the inspiration images are part of it. And then they worked with the printers at Color Code to create this document of that experience. I just think it's really beautiful. That's cool. So that's yeah, that's one I, of the shares we brought. I I have this thing. I think every printmaker wants to be a musician in yeah in well, secret. Bad. You know, like all of the friend, all my friends that are musicians, uh, some of them want to be printers too. But um, I think it uh, goes 
with the territory in a lot of ways that um, a lot of printers are musically minded, but not very talented musically um, and sort of secretly want to be able to st stand up on stage and, and play instruments and have fun that way. But um, well, I think right. there's like a collaborative nature in printmaking that's similar to being in a band. Like you're working mm -hmm. with machines and you're sort of at their mercy some of the times mm -hmm. and you know, often a shop is shared with more than one maker. And so you're um, having conversations with each other and taking insights and inspiration and sometimes like actually collaborating on projects together. And, uh, you know, usually there's deadlines and other people like clients or spaces that are part of that experience that aren't making experience as well. So you're navigating that territory too. Yeah. Uh, so I think like there's some parallels to the the process for sure. Yeah, and it's good content too. I mean, um, if you if you like some something about the music, it's a good way to get into something visually. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not unlike poetry and other kinds of forms of art, but um, having something to sort of hang uh, structure onto is a good um, entry point into making something. <laughs> out of nothing in a way. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. so much harder to walk into the shop and say, what am I going to make today? And uh, come up with an idea. But if you've got a, mu a, a song that really carries you or uh, a poem or something like that, that moves you somehow, it it's sort of helps you um, unlock some of that stuff. Yeah. This has been such a beautiful conversation. I I would love to have another one where we talk about pricing. I feel like people oh, yeah. would actually be really interested in that, as nerdy as it sounds. Not at all. You know, I've been in a lot of conversations with folks, I would say over the last couple of years, but especially uh, in the pandemic year, where we're able to sort of connect this way through uh, digital means. Uh, and those conversations often go toward pricing and money. I mean, everybody's thinking about money and how, how they're going to make it, you know? Yeah. Um, and so uh, just being real about how people are doing that. And um, I, I, we, get, we get a lot of questions through Ladies of Letter Press Conference about, you know, how do you charge for your work and what's the right price? And well, I think we, we all do it. Well, maybe another time. Um, and, yeah. and have a chat about that. Leanne from Golden Ginger says pricing combo would be great. So, cool. yeah, that I'll, I'll hit you up with another email. Maybe we can schedule okay. something in, but thank you yeah. so much. I know we've kind of taken a bit more time than, uh, we originally scheduled. So I hope that that's okay. Uh, uh once you get talking about carving wood and making prints, it's, I just, I just want to go to the shop. <laughs> I've, we've been wanting to go to your shop for years. So this has been like the sneakiest way I can get into it without driving all the way to St. Louis. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a drive. I've made that drive. It's a long way. <laughs> it is. But, you know, I would think it would be worth it. So hopefully one day we won't have to just be in our home all of the time. Yep. And uh, I think as soon as we're allowed to leave and go on an adventure, we're going to be like just going to every print shop that we can and hanging out with people and, um, yeah, catching up and making, making things. So awesome. Sweet. Thank right. you so much. Thanks so much for like, thanks, hanging out with us. All right. Everyone I'm for joining and joining in the conversation and asking such wonderful questions. Yeah. So that was also really great. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's a, a real pleasure. All right. Bye. Have a, Have a great, great weekend. weekend. A big shout out to Firecracker Press and to Eric Woods. Thank you so much for having us in your print studio. Chrissy and I hope to one day actually visit there in person down in St. Louis, but it was a treat to see all of the cool projects that you're working on and to like get a glimpse at the kind of machinery that you have in your print shop. If you would like to continue to support us and you think what we do is awesome, you can do a couple simple things for me. You could like this video, you could subscribe to our channel, and if you'd like to see us make more of these things, please consider becoming a patron. Thank you to our patrons. You all are fantastic and amazing people, and it is because of you, Chrissy and I get to continue to make these wonderful videos that bring together our artistic community. If you would like to see Flat Files live, you can go to Instagram and you can catch us there every week Fridays at noon, Eastern Standard Time.